Hey Riv, um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Alex and I am um, on staff with RIV as part of the RIV Kids curriculum team. Um, as your church, we want to um, still be finding ways for you to get connected, for us to be praying for you more specifically. Um, so if you actually head over to rivchurch.com slash live, um, you could follow along with today's message, um, put in prayer requests. Like I said, we have a team of people who would love to be praying for you, um, especially in this season. Um, there's also Riv Kids content, which is near and dear to my heart, of course, um, with two kids at home, but also just um, we create this curriculum for your kiddos to be following along with the message in um, co with content that makes sense to their minds. Um, lots of songs and activities and puppets. <laughs> um, so if you want your kids to kind of engage with what we're studying through the book of Romans, um, you can head over to rivchurch.com slash live and check out that content. Uh, shortly, James is going to be um, teaching through the book of Romans, the chapters 5, 1 through 5. We're going to have Leo read some verses for us um, and then have the mom band come on. We obviously, I'm at home. Um, James will be teaching from the Holt venue and then we'll be having a few bands play some songs for us that have been recorded over the past few months. Um, and I know that this season has been difficult and brought um, hardship and suffering to many of us. Um, so I just want to encourage you to really listen to the lyrics, to let scripture be read over you, um, and just be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. All right, let's hear from Leo for him to read our passage for today. Hi, everybody. I'm Leo, and I go to the Rio Town venue. Today, I'm going to be reading Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also have obtained access through him by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Bye. Sinking sand All of the ground 
when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. On us to stand before the throne, on Christ the Son. As we head into the Christmas season, right, we're in this season of Advent, the last line of that song um, has really encouraged me. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Um, that is such a good reminder right now. I know for me, time feels weird, right? I miss my extended family, gathering together with friends around a meal, sharing our hearts uh, non-virtually. <laughs> um, I just know that it can be hard missing traditions and not traveling and seeing our family. Um, but just to remind ourselves that no matter where we are, we are all celebrating in this season the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. And we're also celebrating that eventually he will come back and make all things new. So this Christmas season, um, we are really excited that we are going to have a Christmas Eve special on Christmas Eve. There have been people working extra hard to put something super festive, extra Christmassy um, together for our Riv family. So there's going to be caroling and um, seeing Riv families from around the area, hearing the nativity story, the gospel message. I know for one, my family is really excited about wearing pajamas to Christmas Eve service this year and sitting in front of the fire and just knowing that uh, as a church family, we are all going to be still celebrating together. So if you're interested in joining us for that, it's going to be on Christmas Eve, every hour on the hour, that it'll be between 3 and 7 p.m. And so you can tell your friends and your families, um, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and have some watch parties uh, just to make it extra festive. I know too, I'm really excited that they, uh, Riv is preparing gifts for you guys uh, that are going to be available around the Lansing area. Um, and as we get closer to Christmas Eve, there'll be more details, but really just to connect us together, make it extra Christmassy for us. Um, so that is something that to look forward to and just to know again that even as we are scattered, as we are separated, we are still joined together by the hope that we have in Jesus and we can still celebrate Christmas Eve in a unique fun, safe way. Before James shares his message today, just wanted to point you to how you can partner with RIV um, to be part of the work that we're doing. You can uh, text the number on the screen if you'd like to give financially or set up reoccurring um, payments, but we just wanted to say thank you Thank you for uh, your generosity, for partnering with us as we proclaim the gospel. And um, I just wanted to ask if you guys will sit and pray with me uh, before James comes up and shares his message from the book of Romans 5, 1 through 5. Heavenly Father, we just praise you, God, for who you are. We ask you to um, open our hearts and our minds as James comes forward to share your word. Um, we thank you for the power that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ, as he came, Lord. Um, we just pray that in the midst of our suffering, we still have hope. In the midst of this season, we focus our eyes on you, who is unchanging, unmovable. Um, we just love you, God, and we just pray for health 
over our community, over our world, over our leaders. Um, and we just love you, God. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity to, to still praise you um, in the midst of this, of this time. It's in your son's precious name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. About uh, five years ago, archaeologists in Jerusalem made a fascinating discovery um, when they uncovered the remains of the Praetorium of Pontius Pilate. And so in the Roman world, the Praetorium was the residence of the governor in each city. And so the Praetorium um, in first century Jerusalem is particularly significant uh, for Bible readers because the gospel accounts tell us uh, that when Jesus was arrested, he was brought into the Praetorium for his trial before Pontius Pilate, who was the governor um, in Judea at that time. And so P uh, Pilate's Praetorium was located in the upstairs of Herod's palace, which was an absurdly ornate residence that included a collection of gardens and towers and banquet halls. And in keeping with Herod's love of the extravagant, um, the 28 stairs that led up to Pilate's Praetorium, to his residence, were made of this very expensive, pure marble. And, and so after Jesus' death, uh, these 28 stairs became a popular destination for Christians who visited Jerusalem. They would ascend the stairs. Uh, it was said that there were actual drops of Jesus' blood on the stairs, and so people would worship, and they would kiss the stairs, and, and that kind of thing. Imagine climbing the same stairs that Jesus did on his way to his sacrificial death on the cross. Very powerful symbolism there. Now, 300 years after the resurrection of, of Jesus, the emperor Constantine's mother visited Jerusalem, and her experience experience on that stairway was so powerful that she had the entire marble staircase transported to Rome, and that's where it's still located today. It's called the Scala Sancta, or the Holy Stairs, and millions of pilgrims have visited this stairway over the years. This is a look from the bottom of the stairs, and you may notice that there are wood planks covering the original marble. Those were added in the 1700s because there were so many people that were going up the stairs, the marble was getting so worn down that there was concern actually that the, the eventually the stairs would no longer be able to be preserved. Now last year, um, they did something really interesting. They replaced all of those wood coverings and for 50 days, during actually during the Pentecost in 2019, so Easter of 2019 to or like early June, they left the stairs uncovered. Covered. And you can see this is a view from the top of the stairs. You, you can see um, that everyone who, uh, the, 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 the worn of, of the travel is in the marble. Everyone who ascends um, the Scala Sancta does so on their knees. Um, and people for those 50 days had the unique opportunity. You can see they were this pre-COVID, obviously. They were all packed in uh, to get a chance to go up the original stairs. Very reverent atmosphere overall. Now, this is all very interesting, but what does this have to do? Why is this important context for Romans chapter 5? Well, in 1510, a German Catholic monk named Martin Luther came to Rome seeking a powerful spiritual experience. And at that point in history, the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant voice in the Christian world, and, and Martin Luther was part of that, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. And the church world and the political world had become co-mingled in some ways that really flew in the face of clear biblical teaching, even the name Roman Catholic Church. There was a lot of, of just really unhealthy things going on there. Uh, in addition, a heavily works-based 
doctrine of salvation had developed uh, within the church that mirrored many of the concerns that we've been studying as we've been re re reading through Paul's letter to the Romans that was written 1,500 years earlier. Um, one example of this unhealthy salvation by works kind of doctrine was the practice of selling indulgences um, in the church. And so a person who gained an indulgence was promised freedom from punishment for, of sin for themselves or for their loved ones or for both. They would actually receive a written certificate uh, oftentimes of this sort of uh, pardon, this indulgence. And you could buy these indulgences with money or with good deeds. And so for example, if you were unfaithful to your wife and that was the, the sin that you were trying to address, but then you donated, donated money for a church building or you said a certain amount of prayers, or you did some good deeds, you could receive an indulgence to offset the consequences of, of your sin. Very uh, 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 anti-gospel kind of practices that were going on there. And the Scala Sancta uh, had become part of this system. It was said that if you ascended the holy stairs on your knees and recited the Lord's Prayer on each stair, you could release the soul of one of your loved ones from purgatory into heaven. Uh, and so again, very toxic, very unbiblical practices. And so Martin Luther shows up in 1510 and he visits the Scala Sancta and he's hoping actually to gain an indulgence for, to free his dead grandpa from purgatory. But Luther's experience on the holy stairs um, turned out very differently than he expected and, and changed his life forever. As Luther knelt on the holy stairs, there were six words from Romans chapter one, verse 17, that reverberated continually through his head. And the words were these, the just shall live by faith. Over and over this truth that Luther had known for years, as it repeated in his mind, it became impressed on his heart. The just shall live by faith. And later on, when Luther wrote about this experience, he remembered it like this. He said, but when, by the Spirit of God, I comprehended these words... When I learned how the sinner's justification proceeds from the pure mercy of the Lord by means of faith, then I felt myself revived like a new man. And I entered at open doors into the very paradise of God. From that time also, I beheld the sacred volume with new eyes. An amazing miracle took place in Luther's life. There in the city of Rome, on the very stairs that Jesus had ascended on, uh, on his way to his death, by the power and clarity of the Holy Spirit, Martin Luther understood God's mercy. He was revived like a new man. He beheld the precious sacred volume, the Bible, with new eyes. He comprehended for the first time, we are not made righteous by our works. We don't need to buy an indulgence or earn one through our good deeds in order to be saved from our sin because in Christ, we are already free. His shed blood is sufficient. Our justification proceeds from the pure mercy of the Lord by means of faith. This was the central theme of Martin Luther's efforts uh, to uh, bring reform to the church, to help launch the Protestant Reformation. And it's the central theme uh, and message of Paul's letter to the Romans, one that we pick up again today as we move here into Romans chapter five. This is verse one. It says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith. And so if you've been with us the past few weeks, uh, you, you, as we've been looking in Romans 3 and 4, you've, you, you remember Paul has been making this convincing case that Christians are justified. They are made righteous solely 
by their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Luther called this doctrine sola fide, or in faith alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, is how a a person gets saved. And now Paul is going to describe three things that are true uh, of people who have that faith in Jesus Christ. The first one is this, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us who have faith in Christ are no longer subject to the wrath of God that Paul described earlier on. You may remember back from Romans chapter one. Instead, we have peace. Uh, The word in the Hebrew for peace is shalom. It means wholeness, completeness. We have peace. Our relationship with God is restored. Now let's not blow past that. Think of how significant that is. What a gift to have our relationship with God be whole and complete and restored. If that was the only benefit of justification by faith, wouldn't that be enough? But that's not the only benefit. There's more. Paul says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. The word uh, that Paul uses for access here is prosagage, which literally means come toward. It implies an intimate face-to-face interaction. And so it's one thing to have peace in a relationship, in our relationship with God, to be kind of in harmony. Uh, But it's even more significant that what he's saying is we can draw near to God and have an intimate relationship with him by means of his grace. And that's not a future expectation. He's not saying one day we we will be able to do that. Paul says this is a grace in which we stand, which means right now, today, this minute, through Christ, we can confidently come toward the God of the universe. And so in Christ, Paul says, we have peace with God. We have access to God And then there's a third benefit. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the the word Paul uses there for rejoice is kauhaomai, which is often translated as boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Kauhaomai literally means neck high. It's this God-given confidence a person has to walk with his head or her head held high. Not because of themselves or their own works, but because in Christ, because of his work on the cross, that person has peace with God. They have access to God through his grace. They have hope in God's glory. And that's a lot to boast about. It brings about this, this, this centeredness, this confidence In the Lord. And then, as if that weren't all enough, uh, Paul adds one more thing here in verse 3. He says, And not only that, we have peace and access and hope and grace, but also uh, we uh, also rejoice in our afflictions. That's a bit of a turn, isn't it, in, in, in what Paul's saying here? This is one of those Bible verses and concepts that can make us scratch our, our heads a little bit. You know, there are lots of ways that people respond uh, to their afflictions, right? Um, some people complain about afflictions. Others will shake their fists. Some people will, sh- will curse God in their aff- afflictions. Some people will throw worry at their afflictions. Lots of responses, So why does Paul say that we, that he's talking about those who are justified um, by faith in Christ, why do we rejoice or boast in our afflictions? I mean, I get why we would rejoice in the peace and the access and, and the hope we have in Christ, but why boast in our afflictions? Now, Paul's gonna actually answer this question here in a moment. He's gonna give us a because But first, let me just define a couple of of the terms here so we know what we're talking about. What does he mean when he's referring to an affliction? The word Paul uses here for affliction is the Greek word thlipsis, which comes from uh, the word that means friction or, or pressure. And so the implication 
of this word flipsless, flipsless is there's an external pressure or friction that's creating internal unrest. Uh, afflictions are, are like external forces that, that create uh, discouragement or, or fear or, or uh, anxiety is a typical uh, response to affliction. Instead of neck held high with confidence, the head hangs low with concern, right? For most people, COVID is an affliction, Movements are restricted, plans are, are canceled. There's a lot of frustration. There's fear and anxiety about being sick, uh, about employment. Uh, there's financial pressure. There's relational friction. Uh, it's just internal unrest is, is, is bubbling through. And affliction is part of life. I mean, in the past couple of weeks, um, just in my own conversations with folks from Riverview and, and, and other places, I mean, I've talked with people that are struggling with divorce, with the illness of a child, uh, with their own illness, with disabilities, with financial need, with, with isolation. These are afflictions. And as a, and a, a bit of an aside, I will say, um, it has been amazing to see the Riverview family caring for one another in the midst of affliction. As, as sort of some of these um, uh, situations have come into my frame of reference and I've, I've reached out to folks for help, help, I've seen God's grace in your generosity toward one another. If, if you're struggling, if you, as you, we're talking about afflictions, you're like, that's me. I would encourage you to reach out to your venue pastor or your life group leader or ministry leader. We might be able to connect you with some people who are more than willing to step in and serve your needs. Now, along with affliction, I think the other word that's, that's helpful for us to define here in Romans 5, 3 is the word in. Little word there. Um, what does he mean? Boasting in or rejoicing in our afflictions. The, the word actually means in the midst of or among and so when Paul says we boast or rejoice in our afflictions, he, he's not saying that the object of our boasting or rejoicing is the, reflect, the afflictions themselves. It's, it's God. We boast in God in the midst of or while our, we're, we're among our afflictions. Now, why is that? Well, here's what Paul says. He says, not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. And so Paul says, here's why those who are justified by their faith in Christ but rejoice in, in afflictions because if we persist through affliction, eventually hope will be the result. And he describes this sort of cycle, this process that, that happens here. It starts when we face an, ex, an affliction and then we rejoice in the midst of it. And, and what that produces is endurance. Biblical endurance is, is when you're able to maintain your trust in God and believe truth regardless of your circumstances. And because affliction involves pressure and friction it creates the opportunity for endurance, doesn't it? And then endurance in turn produces proven character. Now we all kind of have this sense of maybe what character is, uh, but I thought uh, godquestions.org, their definition was helpful. Character, they define it as a person's strength of moral fiber. When a person has proven character, they've demonstrated faithfulness over time. There's a consistency to their life they're trustworthy. Endurance produces proven character because it tests a person's character over a period of time against a variety of circumstances. And then proven character, Paul says, in turn produces hope. Now, how, how does that work? Well, hope is the confident expectation that God will, will keep his promises, right? We have this expectancy this trust toward God. And so when a person of proven character consistently believes and lives by God's promises and trusts in who God is, it produces hope in them, but also for, for people around them as well. How often does our own hope grow 
as we witness the faithful endurance and character of others who trust God in the midst of their afflictions. There, there, there are few things that are more inspiring than that. We see God's trustworthiness in the response of other people. And Paul says this hope uh, will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, I think we're learning a lot about where people actually place their hope during this season in our world because affliction um, puts hope to the test, right? Where is your hope really? And is your hope actually fulfilling the role you think it would or should in your life? There's lots of things uh, that we can place our hope in that will end up disappointing us, but not God. Paul says when we hope in God, that hope will not disappoint, regardless of the afflictions that we face, because God's power and generosity are unmatched. He's given us his spirit through his Holy Spirit. He is pouring out his love in our hearts. Sola fide, faith alone. You can see why these six words, the just shall live by faith, were so significant to Martin Luther and why they're so significant for us. This study of Romans is so powerful. Sola fide, therefore, since we have been justified by faith in Christ, Paul says we have peace with God. We have access to God. We stand in God's grace. We rejoice in the hope of God's glory, regardless of our circumstances. And so today, maybe today for you, it's the very first time that you've comprehended the pure mercy of God like, like Martin Luther described there. Maybe you're feeling yourself revived like a new woman or a new man. You're entering at the open doors into the very paradise of God. You're getting, so maybe today is the day for you to get saved and we rejoice with you and for you because this hope that you have in Christ will not disappoint God's love is being poured out into your heart through his spirit. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe today for the first time in a long time, you're reflecting on the abundant blessings that God has lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe this season has been heavy. Your, your head has been down. You've been just bearing the weight. Uh, and this perspective is, 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 is so needed for us, right? Take some time today to give thanks for the grace in which you stand. I think it's worth uh, uh, taking out some paper, getting your phone out and, 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 and begin to, to write down, keep track of what are some things that, that you're thankful for. Maybe that you tend to take for granted the peace that you have with God, the grace in which you stand, the hope that we have in his glory. That list of truths that, 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 that you maybe are starting today becomes a great reference point when you face affliction, right? See, whenever we face affliction, our faith and character are tested. And so we should always be asking ourselves, how is God shaping me to become more like Jesus through these circumstances? And remembering what's true about God enables us to rejoice in him in the midst of uh, our afflictions. Earlier today, uh, just a couple hours ago, I received an email from a friend whose spouse uh, has been sick with COVID. And it's been really hard and it's been for a long time. And, and they're finally turning a corner. And she wrote this, she wrote, even as we struggled through this COVID, my heart and soul knew Jesus was the only one I could turn to for deep rest and peace. Nothing or no one else could really provide what we needed in these dark days. Jesus is truly our resting place. He was and he is faithful. 
And her words brought me hope that the same God who has already poured out his peace, his grace, his hope, that he will sustain and grow us in endurance and character and hope regardless of our circumstances. See, the thing is, this season of affliction will pass, God willing, right? The question is, who will we be when it does? And how do we pass the hope of the glory of God on to others in the way we live? Now, maybe today you've realized that in certain ways you're still trusting in your own good works to make you righteous. We all do this. This is something that's been wrestling. I've been you know, bouncing around in my mind here too. We tend to rank ourselves uh, above or below the people around us. Kind of, you know, that's one way of evaluating ourselves based on our, our good works and our actions and who, you know, how, how we do. Uh, we, we, we sometimes think God owes us because we do certain good things. Even though we're already justified because of Christ, we spend a lot of our time trying to justify ourselves in the eyes of others. I want you to write down this verse and I want you to memorize it and I want you to dwell on it. I want you to read it every morning when you get out of bed and every night before you turn out the lights. It's from Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. It says, for you are saved by grace, <coughs> excuse me, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. This is not from yourselves. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast in their works. The just shall live by faith. Therefore, therefore, Paul says, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we're gonna continue um, our time of worship here today with some more singing. And we're gonna actually start um, with a song that was written 500 years ago by the great German reformer, Martin Luther. Um, let me read a part of that song as our clothing prayer. And then we'll sing the whole song together and then uh, maybe another one and, and um, continue our time in worship that way. So let's pray. Um, here are the words that, that Martin Luther wrote. We'll use this as our prayer. If we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. The Lord of hosts, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. Amen. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fails.
Well, thank you for gathering together with us today for service. If there's ways that you're looking to get connected, please go to rivchurch.com slash live, um, and we'll definitely be in touch. And set Christmas Eve on your calendars, of course, because we cannot wait to celebrate Christmas together um, with our Christmas special coming up. All right, guys, we will see you next week. Take care. Thank you.